We've already talked about the Himalayan mountains, now let's talk about some other key landforms of South Asia. When we think about South Asia, we have to think about the role of the rivers in determining where a large amount of the population lives. Now, we're going to find out that it pretty much throughout most of this region people are living. However, in the case of the Indus River, right along that river, and just, you know, 10, 20 miles in either direction, in what we call the floodplain, we see a large amount of the population in Pakistan living along that Indus River. In the Ganges River there in India, overwhelmingly huge amount of the population of India, uh, the heart of India, many would say, is along the Ganges River. Now, the Brahmaputra River in Bangladesh and in parts of India, you can see uh, along that river, dense population throughout much of the trek of it from Tibet and East Asia, working its way around the Himalayas down to Bangladesh, is through a very sparsely populated area. Something we have to consider when we think about rivers, once again, is when they go through multiple countries, what happens in one country, what they do to the river upstream, can affect what happens downstream. So that's something definitely to keep in mind in the future when we think about this particular area of the world. Uh, and so, you know, we think about Pakistan. The Indus River is obviously the key river for that country. But look where it originates. It actually originates in East Asia on the other side of the Himalayan mountains there in Tibet. Um, so what what they decided to do up there, and then it goes through Jammu and Kashmir. We're going to come back. That's a very hotly contested area. Yada, yada, yada. We can see the, the recipe for some tension. Uh, so two of these three rivers actually begin and originate on the other side of the Himalayas in uh, East Asia, not even in this particular region. Now let's look at some specific key landforms within South Asia beyond the Himalayan mountains. So we also have the Indo-Gagnetic Plain, which is this green area that's highlighted here. Now if we look underneath this uh, topographic map, we see it's very, very flat. Uh, so because it's very flat, here in the Indo-Gagnetic Plain, this area that's, that's flashing, we're going to see a large amount of people living. Further, this is an area that's somewhat tropical. We could say South Asia is a fairly tropical area, very warm temperatures. Uh, but unlike South Asia, or sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, here we actually have an area that's relatively flat in which it can do a, a good amount of agriculture. It's not a dense rainforest, it's not a super dry desert. Uh, so here we see an area that can feed a large population, which we find here. It's called the Indo-Gagnetic Plain because it goes from the Indus River in Pakistan and it feeds, serves also the, Ga the Ganges River, the Gagnetic, the Ganges uh, River Valley. So once again, the Indo-Gagnetic Plain is where we see a large amount of people living along this very, very flat, but the, along these rivers that are very vital to uh, this particular region. Next, we have these landform features we see on the, the kind of the coastline uh, on the peninsula of the Indian subcontinent. I've labeled them and shown them uh, in white on one side and on black on the other. And so the white line on the western side of the Indian subcontinent are the, what we call the Western Ghats. Uh, so it's G-H-A-T-S, but it's pronounced Ghats. And then on the eastern part, the black line that's in three separate parts uh, is the rugged uh, uh, feature along the coastline called the Eastern Ghats. Very clever names. The Western's on the west side, the Eastern's on the east side. So what these are, these term Ghats come from, actually is a religious term, uh, comes from the Ganges River. It kind of has these steps in which you go to the Ganges River as part of the religious ceremonies. You go bathe in the water. So you have these steps going down. So we think of these as being steps going from the inland area, steps down to the coastline. So that's where the Western Ghats and the Eastern Ghats because they're stepped down to the coastlines as we have these rugged features along, like I said, the parallel along of the coast on both sides. So how do these suckers form? So if we think about it, it's actually kind of like a mini, mini Africa. So the Indian subcontinent broke off of Africa, uh, just like how all the other continents kind of broke off of Africa. And so before they break, they kind of bump up against each other and kind of create ruggedness before they eventually break off from each other. And so the Indian subcontinent being once attached to Africa, uh, essentially broke off. And so what we, where we saw the escarpment uh, there in Africa, the very steep, very difficult to penetrate sides, we can also see over here in the case of South Asia on the Indian subcontinent with the Western Ghats on one side and the Eastern Ghats on the other. Next, we have the Deccan Plateau, D-E-C-C-A-N Plateau. As the name Plateau means, it's going to be an uplifted area in which it has steep slopes on, on, on 
uh, on, on sides. And so we have the western guts on the one side of the deckhand plateau and the eastern guts on the other side. The deckhand plateau is very rugged. We can kind of see that in terms of its landform feature. Uh, historically, it's had a large, you know, large number of people living there. Uh, however, it's really seeing a boom right now, in particular one urban area called Bangalore, in which a lot of high-tech jobs, as we're going to talk about later in this chapter, have moved from developed countries like United States, Canada, and much of Europe, uh, in which they've moved to Bangalore because of the high-skilled workforce that demands a lower wage. So Deccan Plateau, not a lot of interesting stuff going on here. But in the future, there will definitely be, as this is a fast-growing area of India. Now we're going to look at the World at Night map to see the desert that dominates the western part of South Asia. And at the World at Night map, we can see a particular empty spot here in between the Indus River on, on one side of the circle, or that oval inside the square, and then the densely populated Indian uh, population on the other side. What is that gap? That's, that gap is a big desert. Um, what do we call that desert? Well, it depends on what side of the, the desert we're on. So let's zoom in, check this place out. Here we see the white line, the separation of Pakistan on one side and India on the other. And what do you know, this desert is right through the middle of that border. And um, so on the Pakistan side, they call it the Thar Desert, T-H-A-R. But in India, clever name, they call it the Great Indian Desert. So it's the same expanse, it's the same desert, same expanse area of dryness, you know, no vegetation, hardly any people living there. Uh, so typically these aren't really great for borders because there's really not a clear line like a river or a mountain summit or a water body uh, that can separate two areas. Uh, but what we have here is we have a big old desert where on one side it's called one thing and on the other side it's called something else. As always, I like to use a topographical profile to understand the particular region. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do one from the Arabian Sea uh, here where we see A uh, across the Western Ghats, working our way across the Deccan Plateau, the Indo-Gagnetic Plain, and then eventually hitting the greenish lush areas of the, the uh, southern side or the windward side of the Himalayan mountains. And then we get across uh, the dry side, the rain shadow side, and we eventually get to the letter B. And so here's the topographical profile, the cross-section view, the side view of South Asia, where we have, once again, the steep slopes right there along the coast, the Western Ghats, very similar to what we saw in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the very, uh, that escarpment, uh, very difficult to penetrate. Then we have the upland area, the Deccan Plateau, which then eventually goes down to the agriculturally productive, uh, the area that gets uh, a little bit of rainfall from orographic precipitation, but really what it's getting off is the runoff from the orographic precipitation and the snow melt from the Himalayas coming coming down the windward side of uh, of the Himalayan mountains. And of course, on the other side of the Himalayan mountains, it's quite dry, but very elevated there in the Tibetan Plateau. So here's a topographical profile of South Asia.